Hello and good morning. I welcome you all in our first lecture of the course titled Translation Studies and your course code is ENG4206. Uh, before I begin the translation studies, since it is our first first lecture, so I would like to ask you that what is your understanding of translation studies, or have you ever thought that translation can be studied as a subject? So, what is your opinion? So, what, what what do you think about it? Translation uh, refers that we can information. Uh, from one language to another language, converted. Generally, we think that. Okay, that means, to, uh, I mean, uh, to uh, convert one language or one language material to another language. That is your understanding, yes, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Is there anyone who would like to add something else with this? That what is your understanding of translation? What do what do you mean by this? Sir, uh, translation means uh, if uh, we have some books which is in Bangla, we have to translate it in English. And if we have some books in English, we have to translate in Bangla. The teachers refers us some books. Okay. Then actually, why are we calling studies? I mean, is Yes, yes, Shubhasri, go on. Go on, Shubhasri. Sir, can you check that? Sir, uh, there is a target language or source language, and uh, we convert uh, one yes. to another, maybe something. Okay, anyone else? Is there anyone who would like to add something else with this? Uh, sir, yes. Uh, uh, translator is uh, um, uh, a language which we con uh, convert uh, from our own language or our mother language. So, uh, I mean, can't it be like this that it can be from your language to another language? Why are you always mentioning that it's only from Bangla to English or English to Bengali? No, can't... it's um, uh, all about language to target language. Okay, source language is source language to target language. Okay, that's that's good enough, right? So, what do you mean by source source language? Source language, uh, uh, primary language. Uh, source language no, which no, we sir. have, uh, and target uh, language which we want to translate. Language. Okay. Now I have shared the screen. So, uh, just tell me whether you can see the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Translation studies introduction. Okay, that's great. So today we are going to discuss from here. So that is the thing that you can see, translation studies introduction. Now, uh, yes. All right. Now look at this. First of all, we will uh, like to talk about the the etymology. That from where you have got this word translation. I have collected it from the Google and it has explained it there very well. So you can see that, what does it say? I hope you can see the second slide, right? Can you see the second slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, etymology. Sir, it will be easy if you zoom it. Okay, you want me to zoom it? Okay, just, just give me a second, let me check. Here on this button, I don't see this zoom button here. Maybe it's in town. Just a second. Now, is, is it a little bit larger than before? So, is, is it okay now? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, if it is not needed, then you just keep your uh, microphone mute, okay? Keep the microphone mute if it is not needed. Okay, now, so here you see, it says that the English word translation derives from the Latin word translatio, or translatio, whether you pronounce it, because I'm not, uh, actually, I don't know Latin, so the pronunciation might be different, but you can see that it's translatio, so it looks like something like that. So it says that it comes from the word trans, and trans means across. Trans means across. And it has another word that is fair, and from there, 
we have got the meaning to carry. So you can see this is the combination of the two words. One is trans and another one is latio. Latio, that means to bring, to carry. So uh, translate, translatio or translation, it will mean that uh, a carrying across or a bringing across. So a carrying across means from where to where. That means, uh, as Fahim already mentioned that, it means that it is carrying from one language to another language. That is from the uh, so, uh, source language to the target language. So if my source language is Bengali, then and if my target language is English, then in that case, I will translate a particular uh, text from any, from any genre, from Bengali to English, from Bangla to English, that is from the source language to target language. The target language is English. We can also do, uh, I mean, do the, the just opposite. For example, from uh, English to Bengali. So that in that case, English will be your source language and your target language will be the uh, mm -hmm. Bangla language. So this is called ca carrying across. Mm -hmm. That is, we are carrying across, uh, carrying it from one, I mean, one language to another language. So that is the idea of the carrying across. Now, um, now in the next slide, uh, it says that the, the Roman language and the remaining Slavic languages have derived their words for the concept of translation from an alternative Latin word. You see, there is another alternative Latin word that is called traductio or traductio. This is another Latin word, so the pronunciation, I'm not sure about it, but how to pronounce it. But you can see from there, traductio, traductio, itself derived from traducere. That means to lead across or to bring across. So from transis, across is there, you can see that. And duetio means to lead or to bring. So in any way, whether you say uh, trans, translatio or you can say traductio, in, in whatever way actually you try to explain it. But the thing is that, or idea is that, that means you have to continue it from one language to another language. That's why it's called uh, that to lead across. That means you have to lead the source language to the target language. So if the source language is Bangla, and if you want to translate that Bangla, uh, Bangla text from Bengali to English, then English will be the target language. So you see, we are leading across from one language to another language. We are carrying our work from one language to another language. That we call uh, to translation. Uh, formally, actually, that, that, that is the meaning of translation. So far, we have got it from here. Okay, now I'll move on to the next slide in slide, uh, slide four. Here you see, it says that ancient Greek term for translation, which is meta metaphrasis. So the Greek actually, they use the term metaphrasis, that means it's speaking across, uh, has supplied English with metaphrase. So in English, we have a term that is called metaphrase. And then there is another term that we call paraphrase. So here you see the ancient Greek term of translation, that is metaphrases, which means speaking across, has supplied English with metaphrases, metaphrase, which means a literal or a literal or word for word translation. So you see, the, uh, although the, I, I think that you know that uh, you have heard uh, this phrase of word for word translation. Uh, for example, uh, if I give you a task to translate something from one language to another language, so you can choose between paraphrases and you can choose between metaphrase. So metaphrase and paraphrase, you can choose between these two. Metaphrase means uh, if I give you a single sentence from from Bangla, then you can translate it word to word as it is in the Bangla. You can also translate it in English just like that without changing anything, even the word word. So you try to maintain the whole diction and the structure. Uh, on the other hand, in the paraphrase, that is saying in other words. That means uh, in Bengali we call it bhava nuvan. That means you will take the idea from there and then you will translate that idea, not the exact phrase, not the exact word from the type source language. So from source, source language, Bangla, you're not translating it as it is, but you're just taking the idea and then you, you are translating that idea into English. So you see the metaphrase and paraphrase, uh, these are two basic, you can say the two basic uh, classification of translation. But we'll go for other classifications, uh, I mean, in a while, so you just bear with me. Uh, this is the very basic discussion so far. Now, here, metaphrase, it says it corresponds in one of the more recent terminologies to formal equivalence and paraphrase to dynamic equivalence. Now, in uh, in future, actually, we will have this. Uh, we'll have some chapters that we will call the equivalence and equivalent effect. So we'll be discussing the equivalence and the equivalence effect in in uh, in our coming lectures. But here, just for your basic understanding, you can see metaphrase. When you say word for word translation, that means you have to be very much formal. Don't you think so? If you want to try to translate one text, one Bangla text from Bengali to English, you, you must be very formal. What do you think about it? 
What's your opinion? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Uh, the question we're saying from equivalence means equivalence Sorry. means that will be equal to the equal to the source language. Okay, so that means that the source text and the target and the target test or TD, they will be same. They will have they will uh, carry the same weight. Sir, same I weight. want to say something. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Sir, the sound is not properly heard. So, uh, please. Fine, can, fine, can I have a if you. Uh, yes, sir. We are, but sometimes a little bit. Uh, maybe longer. because of the because of the internet uh, network. So that's why that could be the only reason. Uh, okay, don't worry. I'm going to share this uh, recorded video. So anyway, if you miss any point, so you can watch the video and then uh, you can clear your confusion. So don't worry about it. Just try to. Listen. That metaphrase and paraphrase is the two terms, and here we see that when actually we will be doing metaphrase or word for word translation, we have to maintain the formal equivalence. For example, in Bengali, the word that we will have in the Bengali, uh, the source text, we have to try to use the same kind of equivalent word in, that is found in English. Got it? Okay. And also, we have to maintain the uh, structure, the syntactic structure, diction, and also the rhetoric and prosody. For example, if you uh, are translating a poem, from Bengali to English, then in that case, you have to maintain the rhyme, you have to maintain the rhythm, and also you have to maintain the exact word, I mean the equivalence in the, in the target language, you have, to find, you have to find the equivalence in the target language. So word for word translation is, in a sense, it's very difficult because you have to maintain all the formal uh, equivalence in both the language. So that is a huge chance. On the other end, in the paraphrase, uh, which is called dynamic equivalence, so actually you can take the liberty, you can take the idea from there, and then you can translate it. So it's not just like word for word translation, you can deviate from the original text, but without distorting the original text, you take the idea, you keep the idea intact, but you're not translating as uh, it, it is in the source text. So you will take some liberty uh, and you will take the idea to translate the text. So that, that's why it is called, it is dynamic, because you can, uh, you can use different kinds of strategies and you can also um, take the liberty of translating that. The translator himself, he will decide that how much actually he wants to take the liberty to translate the source text into the target, um, into the tar target language text. Okay, now we'll move on to the next slide. In the slide, in the fifth slide, you can see that strictly speaking, the concept of metaphrase of word to word translation is an imperfect concept because a given word in a given language often carries more than one meaning. And because a similar given meaning may often be represented in a given language by more than one word. So you see, word for word translation. So where is the challenge? Where is the difficulty? Uh, rather, we should say, yeah, it's, it's a kind of challenge, why? Right? If you try to translate something word for word from, for example, from our mother tongue, Bengali or Bangla to English, you'll find that in Bangla we use some words, you, you, you will not find any equivalent word in English. You can use something very close to that, but you will find it very difficult to find the exact diction, the exact word, or the corresponding word for that particular word. Can you give me an, an example? Uh, or have you ever faced that kind of thing that when actually you wanted to say something uh, and you wanted to translate that particular expression in English. I mean, you found that that yes, word actually, it's, it's, not, it's not there in English. Yeah, can you give me any example, any word, any expression that which is, which simply we can't translate in, into English. I mean, in a sense you can say, I'm translating. Yes, sir, there are so many sentences uh, that is called the Bengali like that. So, okay. not, um, word to word translation is not like that. Now, you see, I'm asking, for, I'm asking for an example. Let me give you an example. For example, the word onurak. What could be the possible Bengo, I mean, English translation of the English word for onurak? Maybe love. Actually, there is no I mean, exact word. Lines. I mean, in English, actually, they don't use this kind of word, but it's kind of very romantic kind of expression, and, and it's completely our expression, Bengali expression. I mean, it's a kind of emotion, and this kind of emotion, maybe it is found in English, but maybe they express it in a different way. So you can see that there is no exact equivalent found, I mean, of this word work in English. So when you try to translate something, I mean, word to word from one language to another language, sometimes you face the difficulty because a single word might have different kinds of meaning, layers of meaning. For example, especially when you try to translate poetry from one language to another language, you must be very careful and you must have certain kind of expertise or command over both the language, the target language and the source language. For example, Bengal and English, you have to know the both very, uh, I mean, very perfect. And uh, 
that means you must be an expert in both the language in Bengali and English if you really want to be a translator. Because uh, you can see that sometimes poet they use the same word, but they mean, um, actually they mean uh, the different. We call it pun. That means playing with the words, and also uh, sometimes they're very much allegorical. Sometimes they're very much metaphorical. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you get the point? I mean, the difficulty of translating word to word that we are saying that it is difficult because a poet can use a word, but he can mean something else. But when actually you try to translate as word, word, to, word to word translation, then you can miss the meaning, the hidden meaning beneath that word that you can see in the text. So that's why there is a risk that you might misinterpret, uh, I mean, the poet's idea that actually he has shown by the use of particular words or phrases. So that's why word for word translation sometimes is very risky because you might lose the lose the idea in between. So that's why we call it I mean, lost in translation. Uh, on the other way, paraphrase, paraphrase is also, I mean, useful, but sometimes actually we, what we do in the paraphrase, we actually in the paraphrase, in, in these concepts, we just try to translate the idea or the concepts. And there is also a certain kind of danger in it that when actually you do paraphrase, and if you take too much liberty, then there is a possibility that the, that the main text and the translated text, they might seem different texts. As a translator, if you take too much liberty to translate a text, uh, instead of going for word for word translation, then what might happen that, that two texts, the original text that you're translating into another language, that original text might seem different from the uh, I mean, from the uh, from the uh, from the target tar targeted text, or, tar or you can say the target language. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. I mean, there is there is danger. In, there is danger in both the translation and the studies. I mean, in metaphrase, there is one danger, and paraphrase, there is another danger. Metaphrase, you can't take the liberty, and when you go for word for word translation, there is a chance that you you, you may miss the meaning beneath the meaning. Okay, and what the are, of metaphrase. And that is the metaphrase, word for word. And on the other hand, in paraphrase, also you may have some problem. The para yeah, paraphrase means just translating the idea, not word for word. You read the text, you get the idea, and then you try to translate it. It is not exactly word for word translation. So you take some liberty. Just you're translating the idea. So it might happen that people may find, the readers may find that the original text and the translated text, they might appear completely two different texts. Okay, now, what is translation? We have already talked about logical definition. Now, let's talk about what is translation. Let's see what do we understand by translation. Now, here you can see in slide six, it says that translation is the communication of meaning from one language, that is the source, to another language, that is the tongue. So, translation refers to written information, whereas interpretation refers to spoken information. So you see, translation refers to written information. Usually, we mean translation means uh, the written text. What do we mean by translation? We mean that we will translate a written text from one language to another language. But you can see sometimes uh, in different uh, international conferences, you will find that in the international meetings and conferences, you'll find that there are some people, there are, uh, or at least one, inter one person, he's standing behind the main speaker and he's translating it into different language. Because maybe the speaker only knows English, he can't speak Chinese. For example, Donald Trump or any other American president, if they visit uh, China, so when actually they will deliver their speech in front of the Chinese uh, people, Chinese delegates, so you'll see that they will, uh, the, I mean, the, the president himself, he will uh, deliver the lecture in English, but you'll find that there is someone who is translating it uh, after some time, he's translating it into Chinese language. So in that case, that is also a kind of translation, but we call it a kind of interpretation. So we call it interpret, because when you listen to a, party, a certain speaker, then sometimes it gets difficult to translate exactly the, the thing that the speaker said. So what we do as an interpreter, we listen to him and we take the idea and then we try to make it simple for the audience, those who don't know English or any other language. So the interpretation is not exactly, a, it's a kind of translation, but that is not the formal translation, the way we mean for the written text. So. When we talk about translation, actually, we mean the written text, the translating the written text. Okay. All right. Now I will jump to the next slide. Now, here you see, uh, it says, that, uh, this is also the continuation of what, what do you mean by translation. Here it says, the translation is a mental activity in which a meaning of given linguistic discourse is rendered from one language to another. 
So translation is a kind of mental activity because it's completely mental. You have to use your brain, your memory, your previous knowledge, all these things together. So it, everything is mental. So that's what saying the translation is a mental activity in which a meaning of given linguistic discourse is rendered from one language to another language. So it is from one language to another language and translation is a mental activity. And it is the act of transfer, transferring the linguistic entities from one language into their equivalence into another language. So, for example, when you try to translate from English to French, or maybe from Bengali to Arabic, or maybe from Arabic to Bengali, especially if we talk about the translation of the Holy Quran, so you can see that we have to find the equivalent, equivalent expression, equivalent words, and also sometimes the syntactical features. So we have to find the equivalence. If it is too distant, there's two languages, they're too distant, I mean, in relation, and and then in that case, your translation work will be very difficult. And sometimes because of the cultural difference, because of the linguistic difference, because of the political difference, because of the anthropo anthropological uh, uh, issues and factors, you can find that, that from one language to another language, we find it very difficult to translate because you have to know the culture, you have to know the tradition of a particular group of people if you really want to translate their work into another language. So a translator, he must be very much aware of the cultural tradition of both the language, that means he's translating from and he's translating into another language. So the target language and the source language, you must be very much aware of the, of the society, of the tradition, of the tradition and their cultures. Otherwise it will make his uh, translation work very difficult and at the same time, even if he, uh, if, if, if he succeeds, if one succeeds uh, to translate a particular text from one language to another language without uh, the basic understanding of the culture and tradition, you will find that that translation will not be accepted or that will not be uh, I mean, praised by the critics as a good translation because people who know the tradition and culture of the, both the languages, the target language and the source language, all these people, both the people, those who are aware of this, they will find that that translation is inadequate, inefficient, and that doesn't meet the criteria of a good translation. So there is a, there is a risk of that. So translation work actually is not that much simple. I mean, you have to consider lots of things, especially your linguistic competence, your uh, you, rather, I should say the, uh, I mean the uh, knowledge about the society, culture, and tradition. So you have to have some knowledge about it. Otherwise, your translation will not be a good one. Now I will continue reading from the slides. Can you say the translation? Sir, yes. sir, I have something to say. Sir, uh, Sharmin is trying to join. Uh, okay, let me check. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Now. As I was saying, translation is an act through which the content of a text is transferred from the source language into the target language. The language to be translated is called the source language, SL. So we'll come across this uh, abbreviation very frequently. I mean, well, actually we'll, talking, we'll be talking about this translation studies. So remember that SL means source language. And whereas the language to be translated into or arrived at is called the target language. So from Bengali to English, if we try to translate, then Bengali or Bangla will be the source language and English will be the target language. Similarly, if we try to translate from English to Bengali, now you tell me, if I, if I want to translate a English novel from English to Bengali, then which one is the target language and which one is the source language? Can you tell me? Sir, source language is English and uh, the target language is Bangla. Excellent. Yes, that's the idea. Okay, so always remember this, uh, I mean, this binary, uh, otherwise you will find it difficult. So don't get yourself confused. Now, the translator needs to have good knowledge of both the source and target language. That means he must be very much, I mean, competent in both the languages. And at the same time, in addition to high, to a high linguistic sensitivity, as he should transmit the writer's intention, original thoughts and opinions in the translated version as precisely and faithfully as possible. So you see, these three things, if you just take a look at these words, writer's intention, original thoughts and opinions. That means when you want to translate a particular word from the source language to the target language, so besides or along with the good command over the languages, vocal languages, you must also be very much aware about the writer's intention. That means the original writer, the author of the text that actually you want to translate, what was his intention? Actually, what did you mean by this word? So you have to understand his intention. And also you have to read his original thoughts, the original thoughts of the writer. Actually, what did he mean? What he wanted to say in the bulk of this particular text? So you have to understand it. And also 
you have to consider his opinions, his views about his own work, or what actually he was trying to opine, I mean, in his text. Also, you have to uh, take care of those things. So when actually you can take care of all those things along with, they're actually the culture and tradition, it hasn't been mentioned, it may come later. So you need to consider all these things together. Now, uh, let me jump to the next. Now, here's the next slide. Now, due to its prominence, translation has been viewed differently. According to Ghazala, uh, the writer, translation is generally used to refer to all the processes and methods used to convey the meaning of the source language into the target language. Just read this definition carefully or listen to me carefully. Just take a look at this. Take a look at every screen. What does he say? Ghazala says that translation is generally used to refer to all the process. Remember, just mark the word. This phrase, all the process and methods used to convey the meaning of the source language into the target language. So what does he mean by these all the process? So far, actually, we have mentioned that what are the things that actually have to consider while actually you are translating one particular work from one language to into another language. Now, now here it is the Gadella's definition focuses on the notion of meaning as an essential element in translation. So the notion of meaning that means a semantic, uh, uh, I mean the semantic part that you have to you have to take care. That means the meaning. What does it mean? Is intention. That is when translating, understanding the meaning of the so, meaning of source text is vital to have the appropriate equivalent in the target text thus it is meaning that it is meaning that is translated in relation to grammar style and sounds so you see you have to take care of the meaning and that meaning that has been conveyed in the source text that meaning you have to translate it in relation to grammar style and sounds do you do do you follow me what i'm saying yes sir sorry sir please again okay. Okay, that means when you have to... When Set you the last sentence, please, again. Okay, no problem. So, for example, imagine you are a translator. Just imagine you are a translator. Now, when you are a translator, and if you want to translate from, uh, for example, a text from Bangla to English, then you must take care of these issues. For example, you must know the grammar of both the languages, right? Yes, sir. Okay, that is one point. And you can see that there is a difference of um, this grammatical structure or syntax. In Bengali, we have a different kinds of syntax. I mean, in English, we have a different kinds of syntax, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, if I if I tell you to translate this sentence, for example, uh, uh, for example, I would like to uh, I would like to have a cup of tea. So, how will you translate it in Bengali? I would like to have a cup of tea. I would like to have a cup of tea. What with the Bengali translation? Ami, in our language, tell me. Ami I want to have a cup of tea. I would, I would like to have a cup of tea. I would like to have a or I want a cup of tea. 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 Okay, no problem. All of you are correct in your own sense. For example, uh, who said Ami I want a cup of tea, I mean a cup of tea. Uh, who said that? So it's me too. Who said, who said that first? And some of you say that I mean, So you see, as a translator, all of you are right. I want a cup of tea. That means, uh, really, I want to drink it, right? That's why I want a cup of tea. Or uh, what should I do with a cup of tea? I cannot have. I cannot take a shower with a, a cup of tea. So usually, when I say I want a cup of tea, that means I want to drink. I want to drink tea, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So those who said. I mean, that was Vabaluba, paraphrase. And those who said the exact translation, I that is what for what translation, metaphrase. Now, is it clear? Yes, is it clear now? Yes, okay, yes, excellent. excellent. Now, you see, now let me tell you something else. Now, when we translate this sentence, I want a cup of tea, I cup chai, or whether you say that, I mean, in both sentences, you have seen that in Bengali, where is the verb marker? Where is the verb marker? Where is the verb in this 
বাংলা সেন্টেন্স পান করা করতে চাই স্যার আমি পা চা আমি চা চাই আমি এক কাপ চা চাই চাই ইয়েস ইয়েস এক্স্যাক্টলি হোয়াট ডু ইউ সে ফ্লোভার হোয়াট ডু ইউ সে না সামবডি সাইড সামবডি সাইড চাই চাই এক্স্যাক্টলি আমি এক কাপ চা চাই সো হোয়ার ইজ দ্য ভার্ব ইন বাংলা সেন্টেন্স হোয়ার ইজ দ্য ভার্ব যে চাই ইজ ইট এট দ্য বিগিনিং অফ দ্য সেন্টেন্স ইন দ্য মিড অর এট দ্য এন্ড অফ দ্য সেন্টেন্স হোয়ার ইজ দ্য ভার্ব মার্কার sir in and is exactly in the sentence so in bengali it's at the end now i want a cup of tea in english what is the verb in english what is the verb sir in middle in the middle in the middle so you see in bengali we have a different structure subject plus object and other stuff then the verb it comes at the end but in english the structure is different it is subject verb okay. then object or complement whatever you say so rest of the sentence first they will come later so you see the grammar you have to know you have to have a good comment about over the grammar the syntax you have to understand the syntax this is the syntactic structure of these two languages are different so when you want to translate you must take care of these things otherwise your translation will be misinterpreted by the people or people will not get the idea about the main text you see so they will get confused about the uh, translation and also the style the way actually it has been written in the main uh, i mean in the source text you have to try to maintain the same style uh, as as far as it is actually available in your language so it it should be very close so equivalence must be there if it is not too equivalent if it is too far from the source text it will not be appreciated by the readers as a good translation and also the sounds especially sounds come when we consider poetry okay okay because sounds come in the poetry right and also in the music so if you want to translate a poem from a particular language to another language then you must take care of this because sounds is very important so you will find that the some sounds they are available in english but you will not find those sounds in bangla for example buzzing sound buzz what is the equivalent of buzz what is the equivalent of buzz who who makes this buzz sound buzz, who makes this sound or uh, which insect or what animal sorry sir buzz sound b u z z or z z for your understanding i'm saying so which makes this buzz sound excitement which insect makes the buzz sound or hissing sound his this sound which which uh, i mean animal makes this uh, this hissing sound i am trying to give you some idea that these sounds are available in english but in bengali when you find when you find these words this sir, hissing sound are exactly in bangla do we say that momachi gulo is is no sir no sir that is an english expression but when you find this kind of expression in english form then you must take care of this sound that how we translate it in bangla so you see it's very difficult because some of the sound some of the words their meaning their tone their i mean their what should i say i mean the tone and the sound they're not available in in, in bangla at the same time that some sound some uh some utterances they those are completely for i mean for for the bangla language those are not available in english so you find it very difficult to translate from bangla to english so there lies the difficulty but as a translator you must take care of all these things and you must have very good knowledge about uh, i mean the grammar about the style about the sounds and of course about the cultural tradition of both the languages now here it goes in the next slide slide 9 it says the translation is a process and a product according to kafu translation is a repl replacement of textual material in one language replacement you see the replacement of textual material in one language that is source language by equivalent textual material in another language so this is another definition he said the kafu is saying that it is a replacement of one textual material from source language to another language so from english to bengali or maybe from bengali to english just a replacement of the textual material this definition shows that translation is a process in the sense that it is this is an activity so translation is an translation is an activity right okay because it's a mental thing it's a mental process and also it's an activity so now it's like performed by people through time when expressions are translated into simpler ones in the same language it can be done also from one language into another different language translation is one the other hand a product since it provides us with other different cultures to ancient societies and civilization civilization life when the translated text reaches us so you see uh also you can say translation means you're not only translating the uh the text itself you're also translating the culture the tradition so and also the civilization for example ancient text classics and translation you have read in your english literature courses so there you have said classics and translation those are texts from uh, i mean th thousands of years back right yes sir those classical texts like from homer and also from uh, Sophocles. Sophocles. So all these texts written by these famous writers or authors, you see, they're uh, more than I mean, two thousand, three thousand, even five thousand years back. Actually, they wrote these texts. So when actually those translators, when they were translating those texts, they are not only they only 
uh, it's not that they only translated the text, they also translated the civilization. Because when you read the text, we can find the civilization there, the ancient civilization. When you read the text, we can find the ancient cultures, right? The, from the text. So translation doesn't mean that just what for what translation you're just translating from Bengali to English. You're also translating the whole culture, whole tradition, their belief, their civilization, their rights and rituals also you're translating. So that's why the responsibility of the responsibilities, uh, I should say, in plural form, that the responsibilities of translation is huge. It's unimaginable. And it's a huge task. It's not only the linguistic competence can can make you a, a good translator. To be a good translator, also you have to have a good knowledge about all these things that I have mentioned. Society, culture, tradition, rights and rituals, their beliefs, dogmas, and um, their religion. So all these things actually have to take, any, take, take you have to take, uh, I mean, into your consideration if you really want to be a good translator. Okay, uh, do we have time? Yes, sir. Our class will end at uh, 11.30, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so you said we have approximately 10 minutes, so uh, I will continue. Now, in, the, in this uh, slide number 10, uh, now I will try to explain the concept of translation. Because so far, we have already discussed some of the concepts. Now, we'll uh, discuss these concepts more categorically and more uh, explicitly. Now, here you see, uh, already uh, we have already mentioned this source text means ST, and source language means SL, and target text means TT, and target language means TL. So for example, if uh, I translate from Bengali to English, so Bangla will be the ST, uh, the text the text itself, the text, for example, the novel by any famous writers. So the text will be the source text and the language of the text will be the source language, okay? Language. So yes, ST, sir. SL, source text, source language. Similarly, the target text, that will be the TT, that means from Bengali to English, so English will be the target text, so that will be TT, and the language itself, it will be the target language, that will be TM. So remember this uh, abbreviation because we'll be getting this time and again. Now, the concept of translation that you see, uh, Roman Jacobson, uh, if I just go back to the, I mean, the previous slide, that is slide 10, you see that Jacobson categorizes uh, the translation in this way, and it has been taken from one of his very seminal papers that is called on linguistic aspects of translation. And it was published in 1959, you see. At that time, actually, he talks about this. Now, here you say, according to Roman Jacobson, he's saying that interlingual translation. So he says that interlingual translation means rewording. Rewording. Re means, re means again, that means a different way, and wording means to put it again in a different word. So that is interlingual. So an interpretation of verbal signs by means of other signs of the same language. So rewording means from Bengali to Bengali, sometimes we might be needing to, I mean, to translate it from within the language from verbal signs by means of other signs. So instead of verbal signs, you may have to translate in different other, uh, other signs. So it's not only all the time that verbal uh, translation is there, there are some, some other translations also possible. For example, have you seen the sign language? Sign language? Yes, sir. And also for the blind people, we have Braille, right? Yes, sir. They have different kinds of, they have different kinds of, for the blind people, people, for the deaf people, so they have different kinds of um, linguistic system. So, Interlingual means from within the language, from one system to another system, okay? That is interlingual. Now, interlingual translation, that is the language, uh, translation proper, we call it. This interlingual translation, the second one, we also call it the translation proper, it means that an interpretation of verbal signs by means of some other language. That means here, this is the real translation that actually we're talking about. That means from Bengali to English or from English to Bengali. So there will be a source language and there will be a target language. Mm -hmm. There will be a source text, there will be a target text, there will be a source language, there will be a target language. That is the interlingual. That is called translation proper. The original translation is here in the second category. In the third category, that is intersemiotic translation or transmutation. Transmute means to change something into different thing. That is called transmutation, to transmute, to transfigure, to transform. Okay? That's the meaning. So intersemiotic translation is an interpretation of verbal signs by means of signs of nonverbal sign systems. So the verbal signs that we will take the verbal signs, it will be translated into completely non-verbal signs, something other, okay? Now here, we will get more explanation. Now here it says that throughout history, written and spoken translations have played a crucial role in interhuman communication, not least in providing access to important texts for scholarship and religious purposes. Yet the study of translation as an academic subject has only really began in the past six years. In the English-speaking world, this discipline is now generally known as translation studies. So you see, uh, he is a very famous Dutch based user scholar. That means he, uh, his country of origin, I mean, you can say originally, actually, his forefathers were from uh, Netherlands, that we call Dutch. 
but actually he was an American, and his name is James S. Holmes. He contributed a lot to establish translation as a particular discipline, as a specific or a certain discipline, as a different discipline. And now we have this translation study. So these people like James S. Holmes, they worked hard actually to uh, establish I mean, uh, translation studies as a discipline, as a subject. So, uh, and especially in 1960s, it's developed as a subject. Now, in the next slide, it says that in his key defining paper, delivered in 1972, but not widely available until 1988, Holmes describes that the nation discipline has been concerned with the complex of problems clustered around the phenomenon of translating and translations. I, I will make it very simple for you. In 1972, actually, he published a, an article, and in this article that I already mentioned, uh, actually, he says that the translation, uh, I mean, it is just, uh, you can say, nation means something which is developing as a discipline. At that time, it wasn't a, a specific discipline like English department, like physics, like chemistry department, like BBA department. So it didn't develop at that time as a department. But it was, I mean, it, it, um, work was going on there and people like Holmes and other, uh, you can say scholars, they were working, I mean, to uh, establish translation as a separate discipline or separate, uh, separate subject like translation studies. And it was very difficult, they are saying. He's saying that the complex of problems clustered from the phenomenon of translating and translations. So there are lots of problems to establish these translation studies as a subject. There are lots of challenges right there. Now, by 1988, Marius Del Hondi, in the first edition of our translation studies and integrated approach, was writing that the demand that translation studies should be viewed as an independent discipline has come from several quarters recently. You see, she is also saying that. Uh, I don't know, sorry, uh, also, that this translation is as a discipline, an independent discipline like English or like physics or like computer science. Uh, it says that it, it faced some uh, challenges, and also there, the demand that translation should be viewed as an independent discipline has come from several quarters and researchers. It's saying that people were demanding that translation is very important and it uh, incorporates different disciplines together because if you really want to translate, you need to have some certain knowledge. Now, let me give you an example that why actually people are demanding translation to be viewed as a separate subject. Okay, can you hear me? Can, can you see the screen now? Can you see the screen? Okay, okay. All right, now you see people were demanding that transition studies should be viewed as a separate discipline or independent discipline, why? Just take this example. We have different, um, different subjects and we have different kinds of books. For example, physics. You see, you see physics, it's a sci I mean, uh, I mean, uh, people from the science background. Excuse me, uh, just just mute it because your uh, network is too weak. So that's why I can't I can't hear you properly. Now, the science books they must be translated because you see, not so all of us. Translation, trans yes, translation is separated or. Now, what I'm saying that earlier translation is done. For example, it's separate or listen, listen, listen. Translation is a separate, separate discipline. Listen to me. Can you tell me is there any any university in Bangladesh where yes, where you have heard that there is MA, MA in translation studies? Can you tell me in which universities there is a subject masters in translation studies? Can you tell me any name of the university? Yes, you see, translation studies as a discipline is still, still yes, it's still it is developing. It's it still it is, it is I mean, uh, developing as a subject. And lots of things are going on there and people are working for it. And you can see in, uh, for example, I know one university in UK, the name of the university is University of Exeter. And in, in the University of Exeter, or Exeter, there they have masters in translation studies and lots of uh, foreign universities, they have these masters in translation studies. For example, you know that I used to work in King Khaled University in Saudi Arabia. In that university also, they have masters in translation studies. 
in our country, unfortunately, this translation work, actually, we don't give any value to this. And we really don't care about the translators. And people who work and who try to translate works, they simply can't earn their life. It's very difficult to live your life as a translator in our country. Do you, do you get my point, what I'm saying? Do you follow me? Yes, sir. Uh, so this is the problem. But if there you- is no value in our country. Ex exactly. Okay. But you see, but it's, a, it's an art. It's a very difficult task. Translation, translating a work from one language to another language is just like writing another book. It's just like writing another book. Sometimes it's more difficult than that because you need to care about the source text. All the time you need to care about the source text and then again you keep writing. You see, you don't have that much liberty. It's a very difficult task. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that that in our country, actually, we don't have uh, the, the translation studies as a, that kind of development. Uh, I mean, uh, department. It, it hasn't developed in that way. But in uh, Western countries and also in the Arab Arab countries, because you see, Arabic language is one of the international languages, and it's a very strong language. So that's why they try to translate any kind of book from any language. If a famous book or very important books are there available in the market, you'll find that it will be translated into Arabic. So that's why. This translation studies is an important subject and also an important discipline. You can find it in different uh, uh, universities in the Arab world. For example, I have already told you in Saudi Arabia, in the King Khaled University, they have these masters in translation studies. So uh, now I will jump to the next slide. Now let's see. Now I'm going to show you. Can you see the slide? Can you see the slide? This is the Holmes yes, or Tory Man. So Holmes, actually he, he developed this yes, sir. For, for transition studies. Okay. Now, so here you see the transition studies. It says that uh, it can be subdivided into two pure and applied. So pure transition studies and applied transition studies. In the pure, in the pure translation studies, we have theoretical and we have descriptive translation and theoretical is also divided into two, uh, uh, into two other, that is general and partial. And, and, uh, and also you can see the applied translation, it has been classified into trans translator training, translate, translation aids and translation criticism. And in the partial, I mean, which is also theoretical, but partially it is theoretical in the pure translation, here you see, medium restricted, area restricted translation, and also rank restricted, text type restricted, time restricted, problem restricted kind of translation. So all these uh, are part of the translation studies. And also you see, uh, we have this product oriented, process oriented and function oriented translation work. So when you want to translate a particular work, you have to consider all these things. For example, uh, if I go for that applied, applied portion, fine, can you see, fine and uh, Ritu, can you see that? Yes, sir. Then, then Zina. Applied. Yes, applied. You see, translator training. So, applied translation studies in that particular su subject, what, in the applied translation, what you have to study, how to be a translator. Okay? Yes. That is translator training. That means yes, sir. There, there will be some courses and that will train you to be a translator. That means there are lots of processes and procedures that you have to follow there. So, applied translation studies that will teach you how to be a translator. Uh, that will train. Then also, it will also help you to understand the translation aids. What are the things that you need to be a translator? For example, if I want to be a translator, the basic things that I need that different kinds of dictionaries, okay, different kinds of dictionaries in both the languages, from Bengali to English, English to Bengali, English to English, Bengali to Bengali. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And also, I need internet connection. I need uh, uh, I need a laptop. I need a printer. A different other things, translation aids actually it comes to this. That's for your basic understanding. I'm just saying this. And then also in the applied translation in, in this applied part of the translation studies, it also it will also help us to understand translation criticism. That is how to how to criticize constructively or actually uh, you can say academically how to criticize a translation work. For example, I have translated a work from English to Bengali, and you are another translator or you are an academician, even though you are not a translator, but you know English and also you know. So what you can do, you can take my Bangla translation, also you can take the English translation, the English book, original text, and then you can compare 
and because you know both the languages then you will say that mr shahir's translation is it's okay it could have been better it has this this loophole this, these are the problems okay so in this way it will train you how to be a translation uh, how to be critique uh, critique for, i mean of the translation works so all these things actually are part of the translation study. So you can see translation studies is not that much simple as people actually they think. It's a very difficult subject and in some senses, translation studies as a subject that is interdisciplinary. That means it will incorporate all the departments. For example, if I want to translate a physics book, a physics text, okay? I'm not from the science background, but I'm good at English. Do you really think that I can translate that physics book? Oh, sir, this is very difficult. Or a, uh, a textbook for mathematics? Can I translate that? Okay. No, sir. So, so no, it doesn't mean that only. Okay, okay. Just just mute your microphone and listen to me now. So it doesn't mean that only the people with the English background and good at English they will translate. It's not like that. It's not that simple. In translation studies, any anyone, for example, a person from physics, he wants to translate books from physics to all the physics books from his language to English, or maybe from English to his his mother tongue. So he can also study translation studies. A person who wants to uh, translate his, his religious scriptures or the text, then in that case, he can translate those books. Uh, he can study in this translation studies department, and then he can translate all the religious scriptures from his language to another language or another language to his language. So you see, it is interdisciplinary. Anyone can study translation studies and, uh, and they can learn the technique, how to do it. Later on, they can translate from science, physics, chemistry, maths, entomology, biology, whatever it is. So it's a huge thing. And translation studies is a very important uh, discipline. And, uh, and you see, for translation work, actually, we must have some certain kind of knowledge to be a good translator. Then, uh, we must have the knowledge about the procedure and the process, and also the theories, and also the uh, the linguistic competence must be there. At the same time, we must be also aware about the, uh, I mean, the social, cultural background, and also uh, the rights and rituals, religious beliefs. All these things that we must be very careful about when actually you want to be a translator. And translation studies that will help us to understand all these things, and it will help us to be an efficient and good translator. Okay, with that note, I would like to conclude uh, today's lecture. Uh, that's all from my part. Uh, actually, I have more slides to show you since we don't have enough time. So I'm going to share the slides with you later on and also the video I'll upload it on the Facebook group. So you will uh, get all of the lectures and also the, all the post lectures. Okay, so you don't, you don't need to worry about anything. Okay? Take care of yourself and thank you very much for your participation. Do you have any questions? Thank you, sir. If you have any questions, no, sir. Ask. Okay. Okay, anyone else? Any question, opinion, or discussion? Okay, sir. All right, in that case, I can call it today and thank you again. I hope to see you next time with another lecture. Take care. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.